Hey guys, it's Danny. Alrighty, today we're gonna continue the discussion we started yesterday. So this is pretty much part two of how I go about saving sick dehydrated orchids. Now today we're gonna talk about the most common techniques that people use to help sick orchids rehydrate and bounce back. So I'm gonna tell you all of these methods and also what I would and wouldn't do and of course why. If you missed yesterday's videos, I'll add it down below in the description. So without further ado, let us start the video. Now let us address some factors that are known to help with sick orchids and the most important one is humidity. Now as you might see on my little device I have 66% humidity at the moment. I don't really need to improve humidity way too much in my climate but in other climates where humidity is at 30%, the risk of excessive water loss through leaves is real. So with a dehydrated orchid it will help if you increase the humidity around it. A few ways you can do that are by the use of humidity trays, but with a sick orchid I would not use humidity trays. They simply don't give out as much humidity as you might expect and also it is dependent on temperature and the air movement around it. Another way is the use of a humidifier and I think this is the best way. Ultrasonic humidifiers are the best because they deliver fine mist which is not hot. So steam humidifiers are not necessarily super good depending on the orchid. I would just go for an ultrasonic humidifier and luckily the prices for these devices kind of dropped in the last few years so there's a great chance you will find an affordable one on the market. Another way to increase humidity around an orchid is something I would never ever do. And here comes the part of the video where I explain what I would do versus what I wouldn't do. Before I talk about this, you need to understand that people do certain things because of their experience. Probably if they had good results with something, they will keep doing it. And that's perfectly fine. And obviously, if something has results for you, you should keep doing it. The problem comes that a certain technique might not work for other people because mainly environment issues and not only pathogen issues. Every zone, every climate or even every grow room has their own pathogen balance. Fungal spores and even bacteria are on surfaces and even in the air and they can differ from location to location. And returning to the third technique of increasing humidity using the sphag and bag method or just placing a bag on top of an orchid to maintain that humidity there. I would never do that because I had serious issues in the past with this experiment. Even though I poked holes in that bag, I still had massive fungal infections. And no matter how ventilated I tried to keep my grow room, it kept happening. So for me, that is an absolute no-no with sick orchids. Particularly knowing the orchid is more susceptible to pathogens than a healthy orchid. But other people have great success with this method. I just consider it too risky and that's something I would never do. I would much rather have the humidifier option. Another technique that I would never do, because by mistake I just happened to do it, is soak the entirety of the orchid in a bowl of water. Yes, leaves can absorb moisture and can absorb nutrients, but the whole point of raising humidity is to prevent water loss, transpiration. In the case of orchids that still have one or two roots, soaking the entire orchid is a bit of an overkill anyway in my opinion, because the tiny root system can actually absorb some water, as long as you maintain the orchid in high humidity so it doesn't lose that water very fast, everything should be okay. For orchids that don't have any type of root, I can understand the reasoning there. However, in the past, I did get to experience this technique unwillingly. I just had a massive infestation of spider mites and I tried everything that I could possibly try, excluding pesticides and toxic substances. So at some point, one of my viewers recommended me that I simply drown the pests. And at the time, it sounded like a great idea. So I soaked my Phalaenopsis orchids for 10 hours in a bucket. And the result was the leaves absorbed water, but they absorbed a lot of it. So they became kind of waterlogged. I don't think I filmed it, but I'll show you on the screen how a leaf that absorbed something looks like. It will have darker patches on the leaves. So we are not actually talking about hydration there. We are starting to talk about drowning the tissue or damaging the tissue. So because I have that experience, I am personally wary of doing this. Another thing that I personally would not do is to actually mist orchids or foliar feed orchids that are dehydrated and sick. Yet again, because they are more susceptible to pathogen attacks. And depending on the orchid and the environment, misting or foliar feeding it might lead to stem rot or crown rot, which are two ailments extremely well known in the orchid world. 
It doesn't mean that every time you will water the crowns, you will get crown rot. It just means there is a chance. And that chance is not one in a million, it's uh, lower than that. Some factors will contribute to it, of course, but it is a lottery. You will never know when you will have issues. A hundred times of showering your orchids might prove to be without any bad outcome. And the 101th time you do it, you might just lose all of your orchids. It works like that. It is that type of lottery. And if you don't know what are the factors that can contribute to it, you cannot really improve your chances. Factors that can contribute to an outbreak of rotting are high humidity, seasonal changes, lower temperatures, or even a wind that carries with it a pathogen abundance. And not only pathogens, but pests as well. If you get a few spider mites that just graze a little bit on this cuticle, the cuticle is open to pathogen infection. And the fact that you are misting or foliar feeding your orchids might create a puddle of water directly on that graze. And if pathogens accumulate in that pool of water, they can enter the orchid through the little graze made by the one single spider mite that the wind brought. So it's hard to believe that this can happen, but it can, absolutely can. It doesn't mean it will always happen, but you know, for this reason, I don't like to foliar anything, mist, water, shower the orchids. If I do have to shower them to clean them from a certain substance, I make sure that afterwards I dry them really well. I leave them in front of a fan or outside on my terrace if it's warm enough to properly, properly dry. So I limit further infections on top of the stress the orchid already has. And as a last method, which I cannot say I would never do, people like to offer additives to orchids, things such as Super Thrive or Kelp Max or who knows, maybe other things that are supposed to strengthen the orchid and make it produce a new root system. All of these products are designed to give a boost to the orchid. Now, I've never actually tried or never used these types of products until this year. I considered I never actually needed them. I had perfectly good results without them. However, this year I decided to give it a go with Super Thrive. I have a link down below to the very comprehensive review that I made on that product. Bottom line is I'm not impressed. I don't see this huge difference that I've never seen in the past. Pretty much things go exactly identical to how things went in the past for me as well, but I'm still trying to use it and I'm not dismissing it just yet. In the orchid hobby, it is very common to offer plant hormones, particularly growth hormones. Now, these hormones are supposed to convince the orchid to produce a root system and more growth structures. And in theory, at least, this sounds very good. You do want an orchid to start producing roots, not produce, let's say, a flower spike. Because it can happen, sick orchids can try to bloom. The faster a dehydrated and sickly orchid starts to produce roots, the faster it will rehydrate. So I'll give it in theory, it sounds good. I personally am not convinced, but just so you know, this technique, or actually supplement, is used in the orchid hobby. The opinions just happen to be very split on the subject. Some people swear by it, while other people really, really have a strong opinion against these additives. So I guess this will be up to you, and as I was saying, I'm still experimenting with something. If you're not sure if you should spend your money on additives though, I'm here to tell you that you can do without additives as well. Now, even so, with all of these techniques, there is never a 100% success rate. And this is because, well, it depends on many, many things. Not only environment and you doing things properly and protecting sick orchids from disease, but it has to do with the genetics. And particularly in the orchid hobby, we are dealing with so many hybrids and in cultivation, there is no proper natural selection. So we can end up with some pretty frail individuals, which no matter what, if they start to go down, they will never bounce back again, no matter what we do. So it's important to understand that because you should not be let down by some failures. We all have some failures, sometimes due to ourselves, but other times due to the orchids as well. I believe it's wrong for a product or a person to guarantee you 100% success because that is not the reality of things. And it's not something we should be sad about. We are dealing with individual plants, with live beings. They are not all identical, so pretty much products will not work on them in the same way. Also, whenever you see videos of people doing certain things, I think it's important for you to think about the things that you are seeing. The techniques that you see might not be wrong, but they might not apply to you. They might be useless or even detrimental to you. For example, I talked about the humidifier and I believe it's a wonderful addition to a grow room. But if you have a very high humidity to begin with, obviously you do not need a humidifier. 
Furthermore, increasing humidity even more might be detrimental and might promote some disease in your growing environment and particularly to sick orchids. See if some steps are needed in your environment or not and if something is just downright too dangerous in your environment. And I think doing that will eliminate some of the risks when it comes to what we do with our orchids. Alrighty guys, this has been the topic for today and actually the past two days. Hope you've enjoyed it and you learned something new. And you know the drill, if you did like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you hated it, give it a thumbs down. Subscribe to my channel for regular orchids and plants videos. And don't forget to turn on notifications so you never miss a video. And with that said, I'll see you all next time. Bye! And just look at her, she's almost open. This is the Encyclia vitellina and already, oh the color, I don't know. It's so pleasing to me, these worm colors, oranges and reds and all of that. The problem is that in the orchid world, at least this is how I see it, there is an abundance of purples and pinks. And while they're beautiful colors as well, it's a little bit too much for me. <laughs> so, so I'm always on the hunt for red, orange and browny type of orchids, even golden colored orchids, pretty much whatever screams autumn, it's just right up my alley. And it just so happens we're close to Halloween and the Encyclia vitellina hopefully will be open for Halloween. And I think for Halloween I'm just gonna do a special, not a scary video like I kinda do. I'm just gonna make a top, a top um, let's say Halloween colored orchids. How about that? Are you guys interested in that? I think I should do more favorites tops.